streaming to the wrong place. That would be funny. Okay, never mind. I am streaming at the right place. Oh, okay. Oh, those are the comments, eh? Yes. Cool. I forgot to set it to auto go live. That happened with a stream I did with Josh Haley where I didn't hit go live for the first 45 minutes. So we were talking to ourselves. I try <laughs> to avoid doing that again. So that's why I learned my lesson, which is I always ask, hello, can you hear me? Before I begin, can you hear me? <laughs> what are you streaming on? Uh, YouTube. Yeah, I stream into the YouTube stream. and I record a copy and uh, using this mm, pile of shit computer over here. Oh, that's cool. It's like some 10-year-old Lenovo. I think we are. Okay. Yeah, we're live. Type the number 8 in the chat if you can hear me. See, this way they can't mess with me. Ah. Let's see. Type 8 in the chat if you can hear me. Actually, I should do this so that they can't lip sync me. <laughs> be hilarious. Someone's just signing up just to lip sync. Oh, you never before you begin, I can, can't hear I, you. I can't Eight. confirm. Oh, there we go. Eight. Qu quality is shit. Is that true or is that bullshit? Let's see. We can hear and see you. That's only a lot of eights. There we go. Yeah, only one person <laughs> bitched about quality. so it's One guy said nine, so that's... <laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Hope you're having a lovely day. So a comment that I get on this channel every single day is, you know, uh, you've talked about all these companies that are against right to repair, against tech freedom, against you owning what you actually bought and paid for. Why don't you give us an example of something good? Well, I mean, where? Like, where? Like, I'm, where? Um, but today is a very rare opportunity we get to. Thank you very much for coming by. Yeah, hey, thanks for having me in, eh? Lovely folks at Edison Motors. They are creating a company that does electric trucks and electric, also electric truck uh, refits. So you, you'll take old internal combustion engine trucks and retrofit them with uh, motor kits. So That's that they can right. Be electric, and you try to essentially do the opposite of what most modern companies do, which is fear monger you out of working on your stuff, which I think is really cool. Well, exactly. I think you should have a right to work on your stuff. Like when I started at Edison is I started my partner, Eric there, and uh, we bought a truck when we sent it to work. It was a 1969 Kenworth. We bought this truck for 4,000 bucks in a farmer's field and every nut and bolt on that truck I can fix, I can service, I can repair. That truck has been in our fleet for seven years out working. And you know, we bought that truck starting. We were broke. It was affordable. And then we bought another truck. Then we bought another new truck. And all of a sudden we realized on the new truck, you couldn't fix anything. Anytime we owned that truck for six months and it spent three months in the shop with this computer code, this computer code. And anytime it would go down, you would have to bring it back into the dealership and they would have to put their computer onto it and they would erase the code and the truck would go back out. And okay, like, I'm not a car repair person by any means. So I'm going to ask a bunch of stupid questions. So hopefully you'll be patient with me. When you say a lot of the modern ones are not fixable and you say, uh, a lot of people have this idea in their head that like the only anti-repair brand when it comes to motor vehicles is Tesla. And there are so many reasons to, take, to just smack them in the nuts with a baseball bat for all the <laughs> things that they do. And I do that on this channel on a regular basis. But what a lot of people I don't think I don't understand is that this is something that virtually every company is going into. Like one advertisement that I, I just showed you when you got here that you, had, you said you hadn't heard of was this uh, ad for question one that happened in Massachusetts three years ago where they were convincing you that you were going to get raped and stalked in a parking lot if question one, if question one passes, passes in Massachusetts. Massachusetts anyone can access your personal, personal data. data. And like, the, they've got all the scary fucking lights in the background and they have the, like, you know, somebody following her with the shaky camera. Wait, why does my personal vehicle need to store, why does my vehicle need to store my personal data? See, None of my trucks need to store my information yeah, about me. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the things, like, everybody, like, the most top upvoted comment in all the videos where I go over this is, okay, like, forget about the mechanic. Why does my vehicle store my shit? Yeah. yeah but, like, uh, uh, the, these fear-mongering campaigns were funded by uh, Ford, General Motors, like, you know, to uh, Toyota, Honda, Nissan, they spent, each of them spent four to five million dollars creating this garbage. They also said that right to repair supports redlining and racism. Um, like, a as if, you know, a mechanic being able to fix your car somehow has anything to do with segregation and housing. They, like, they throw the kitchen sink at anybody that tries to say you should be able to fix what you own. And it's disgusting. And it's something that every brand does. So can you tell me, uh, when you're talking about, like, modern trucks not being repairable, a lot of people think about this in terms of cards and more so consumer cards. They don't really think of how horribly this affects every other field and the thing that i've really try been trying to get into people's heads over the past three to four years is like this isn't just apple this isn't just tesla this is virtually every company and you can't scapegoat one or two or three companies or one or two types of industries for something that everybody's doing so when you talk about the 1969 device that was you know every nut and bolt you could work on and the model ones you can't 
G can you give some common examples of where the, of the, the most egregious ones? Okay, let's uh, look at a turn signal, for example. So that turn signal in my 1962 Kenworth is the same turn signal as my 81 Kenworth. It's the exact same turn signal that's on a 2016 Western Star. It, it was an old school turn signal that has been around since the 1950s. And if you want to do it, it's got two screws. You can take the top cover off, re-solder it if it needs to. If you want to buy a new one, it's 40 bucks. Then uh, Western Star went away from it in the integrated dash. Kenworth in the 2000s went into one that's all plastic molded into the integrated dash. It's got a bunch of features on it. And to give you an example on one of my newer trucks, it went down. It's a $400 turn signal, and it was three days out because they didn't have it in stock which three days of downtime, because you can't drive a truck without turn signals. Well, the truck bills out for $3,000 a day. That's what a logging truck goes for. So that's three days waiting for a turn signal. That's $9,000 because that turn signal plus a $500 part that you can't fix, you can't repair. And that turn signal is different than this model because this model has this features on it and we don't have that one because it has this feature. So they make it integrated into the dash and they put a bunch of different features and all the models have different features. And if you plug the wrong one in, well, that doesn't work. So you get annoyed with it because by the time things start going like this, they start going around four or five years. Well, uh, I can't lose multiple days of work. My customers can't start, can't wait on a load. Well, I guess I got to go back and I got to buy a new truck so that I'm not having these issues because they make tiny little parts fail all over that cause just enough downtime where it starts to be annoying. It starts impacting your bottom line and it's creating these owner operators where you talk to old truck drivers, they could buy a truck. And you, the, all the old timers would tell me when I was starting out, when I was just started driving truck. Well, eventually you become an owner operator, you, you pay your truck off and then you can make some good money because then you don't have that truck payment. But now it's trapping people into these truck payments and there's no reason for it because it doesn't make any sense. Like even for the parts wise, why is that plastic one? It's plastic. It should be cheaper than the old school metal one that you could repair yourself. So the old one was 40 bucks, 50 bucks and the new one's 400 bucks. It, it, it just, it makes no sense to me. And it's... Aside from the obvious thing that makes no sense to me, which is instead of have three days of downtime, why not just get a BMW driver to operate the truck without the turn signal, is uh, what about, uh, when it comes to the standards, um, <laughs> to, what, what is it that makes, like, is that, when you say that's out of stock for three days, is that like a specific turn signal for that specific model truck? Yeah. Or is this a thing where like, you could otherwise take a turn signal from another truck, but it won't work in this one because it needs like the serial number pad or something? Because I don't understand the type of, BS, for lack of a better way to put it, that happens in automotive. I know in my industry what it is, which is like I, I would be able to take this part from this and put it in here, but I can't do that because it has because it needs a calibration routine mm -hmm. they don't get access to. So, what is it that makes it makes you require the like a, a three day wait time to get something like that? So the old school one and the one that that old one I'm talking about, it used to just go around the steering column and you tighten two bolts around the steering column or you'd put a pipe clamp around it, and if you were cheap like I was, you'd put a pipe clamp around it, that would hold it. So it was a separate part, but now it's integrated into the dash in plastic, and it's a molded plastic cover, and it, it covers the steering column, so you don't see that big ugly steering column you see in the old ones. And of course, because of that, it's got plastic mounts with two little plastic tabs. That it goes in there, and it's got a form in there, so you can't just attach the old one in there. And now it's communicating on a CAN bus network instead of on an analog network. So when, one thing, so when that goes down, it takes everything else down with it. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. That, that sounds like a MacBook because there's this whole there's this whole meme of you get uh, like a little bit of liquid in your trackpad and it winds up turning off your SMC. Like there are many laptops uh, on there where if you get liquid in the keyboard, some of your keys won't work, but you plug in a USB keyboard and it works. But with a MacBook, like you get liquid in your Z key and it shorts the power rail to ground that powers the system management controller. Mm -hmm. it, it shorts the uh, the SMC to ground. It'll short like it, it, literally everything will stop working. Uh, you, you you won't even get a light on your charger anymore. Or like with the newer MacBooks, you have four charging ports. But if one of the CD3215s that controls the, the charging port stops working, all of your charge ports stop working. So if something goes wrong with one of you, the more charge ports you have, the worse off you are, because the greater your chance that one of those chips will fail, because you have more of those chips. So the more charge ports you have, the greater your chance of having a machine that actually can't charge. Which <laughs> is kind of, so That's it, insane. But it, 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 like, it's one of these things where the more I speak with people in other industries, the more that I realize that it is not the MacBook that is my enemy. It is not Apple that is my enemy. It is, the, it is that... Um, 
It is that the world is turning into a MacBook. And it's the quarterly profit. They're yeah. worried about making a quarterly profit for the shareholders. How are we going to make a little bit more money this month? How are we going to increase sales a little bit more? Yeah, so this brings me to my question, which is like, you know, be like devil's advocate is, it, okay, what would you say to people that say, well, listen, that, that allows the vehicle to be made cheaper, which allows us to throw all the other bullshit technology into it, which you want anyway. Mm. You know, like when my parents bought like their car, like, you know, the Delta, I forget it was like a Delta 88 Oldsmobile in like the late 80s, it was like 20 or 23,000 bucks. And now inflation is absolutely gone off a you know up but yeah they then, say it makes and, it cheaper and you could still make and you could still get a car for like 18 or 20 thousand bucks rather than a car being 60 or 80 is would your way of creating a vehicle result in something that's not economically viable for the end customer <laughs> no it's the opposite for whatever reason so the, i talk about that old 1969 kenworth i bought it off the original owner so that guy bought it brand new back in uh, 1968 and he, it, he still had the original bill of sale he bought it for about 18,500 bucks and inflationary adjusted that works out to about 150 to 200,000 now depending on how you measure it. That same truck now if I go into Kenworth be about 400 500,000. And so it's somehow now twice the price. And when we found when we manufactured ours, so because we use those common off the shelf, like I use standard type 30, 30 brake pots. I use that old turn signal when we were in number one, it saved us a lot of money in engineering because we didn't have to design every single part. We just used parts that were commonly available off the shelf. But when we go to sell our truck, we're actually cheaper now than the uh, Freightliner E Cascadia. So the Freightliner E Cascadia that's built with all these plastic parts, built all this way, supposed to be assembled all this way is now more expensive than our truck that's built by hand by a team of mechanics in a garage using common parts like that doesn't make any sense to me it doesn't you would think that the, the whole toyota way of manufacturing and the whole like lean production line and all this type of lean supply chain would result in them having especially even just with economies of scale them being able to destroy you like you know, i remember when in back uh, 14 years ago when i started a supply company and i was trying to compete with these companies that were ordering 10,000 or 100,000 screens at a time while i was only ordering 3 or 500 they were able to bury me because you know like i was making $1 a sale they were making 3 and you know it seems like a small difference but when you multiply it over hundreds of thousands of sales they were able to to absolutely destroy me and like it, it, the fact that you can even remotely as a team of like no offense but like you know yeah no guys, no no offense like, taken like, <laughs> like compete with compete on price with that is is insane so like get, getting to that part so like the first thing i'm reading about you is you know you said you or you pre-ordered a tesla semi in 2017 yeah, and yeah. you got like at, like like many people that, that deal with elon musk you got tired of waiting for something that never showed up uh, and uh, like you decided to you know start on your own so can you talk a little about about, about that process and like yes. how it started and uh, I'm honestly interested in hearing about all the failures along the way because oh we failed a bunch but <laughs> like the thing is mo yeah, like a lot of people don't realize that people that do things that are exceptionally successful that work like what you do they it wasn't like it just came to them magically it's usually like oh yeah this is the 18th iteration but the first 17 iterations did this and I'm, I'm very curious to hear about that entire process okay yeah so we reserved a Tesla Semi. We were actually, I got the little reservation thing. I'm the uh, third or fourth person in Canada to actually reserve a Tesla Semi. And um, well, well, about third, fourth person to reserve a Tesla Semi and, in Canada. And we got excited and then we started looking into it. And then we started seeing more videos and checking things. Well, I don't like the way this is done. And if we get this truck, I would change this. And if I get that truck, then this is how I would do this. And we're like, and then I remember thinking like, okay, well the power requirements isn't there. So like I'd put it like, what if we put a little generator on it, like a freight train. And we started looking into, uh, into the, what the sawmill was using. So the, the sawmill in Merritt has three old Laterno loaders and they're all electric. Well, they're diesel electric. One's from 1967, 1969, 71. And they're all unloading two, 300 trucks a day for the logs with electric. I'm like, well, that's electric. And it's been running for 50 years, unloading all these hundreds of trucks a day. What if I copied a little something like this? And that's how I did it. And I was saying it on social media. And, and finally, someone says, well, why don't you build your own truck? And I said, screw it, I will. <laughs> I'll do my own truck. And like, I didn't think it would take off the way it did. Okay, so can you give me an idea? Because like I, I haven't done any sort of logging or anything like that ever. 
uh, yeah. Much, yeah, I grew up in New York. So, like, <laughs> give, give me an idea of what what these these trucks are used for, and like, and like, what what is somebody doing with them over the course of their day? Like, I'm and you also and how much how are you powering them? Like, how much of this is like diesel being converted to electric versus just pure electric? I'm, I'm or batteries. Like, I'm, I'm very curious about that, every aspect of this. Okay, well, I was saying like electric for logging made the most sense in BC because all the trees are up at the top of the mountain, so you're coming downhill loaded and you're going up empty, so you could use the regenerative brake to come down the hill to recharge the batteries to get the mill and then you go back up empty so you barely use any power to go up and you regenerate a lot of power coming down and you're off-road these trucks get beaten up we're loaded to 140 150 000 pounds of logs on a dirt road up in the mountains where we get up to 30 percent grades like three times steeper than you would ever see on a highway in the dirt in the snow like it gets beaten up <laughs> Okay, so if you're at the top of a hill and you're loading thousands of pounds of stuff on and then going back down, and I can see what you're talking about with, um, you know, essentially almost free energy there. I can't say that yeah. Dave Jones is going to kill me. Well, you're using... You get the idea. But yeah, like the, 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 what's the fancy way? You're using the stored potential energy of yes. the logs, turning it into downhill kinetic energy. Yes, or yeah, it is, yeah. It is, it is not, it is not scam-free uh, energy. It's and not it's, free energy. It's... Yes. <laughs> Actually, it's carbon negative energy, if you think about it, because this, the trees are growing, they're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, and as the trees go, it stores the CO2, and then you come down. So we're using stored sequestered CO2 to power our electric vehicle. <laughs> Actually, uh, there's got to be a buzzword there. I just thought of that. Okay, that's got to so be a way. But. So like how much of, uh, of let's say, the, you know, the vehicle that's doing that is, like, how, how much of that is pure electric and battery versus, like, how many kilowatt hours do you have in, the, in those trucks? Versus so like uh, being powered off of a gen diesel and generator. We put about 280 kilowatt hour batteries packs in our truck. And the generator, so we downsized from, normally a truck has a 15 liter engine. We downsized to a 9 liter engine. You get about two hours of run time for about half an hour to one hour of generator time. If that kind of makes sense. And we charge at about 300 kilowatts you per hour. You said about 280 kilowatts or 200 kilowatt hour battery? Yeah, 285 oh, kilowatt hours. Yeah. It, it's, it's pretty big, it's, but it's not when you compare it to all the other electric trucks um, out there that are pushing 600, 800, 1,000 kilowatt hours. We don't need as big a battery. We can either do 200 to 300, depending on your application and how much electric drive you want versus how much we can. What can we go down to, Eric, for the belt bottom, 180? 140, that was a minimal. Yeah, yeah, and the thing that I found, okay, interesting, is like, okay, to correct me if I'm wrong, but for this type of logging work, it's not like you're going cross-country. You're not like, no. you're not taking lobsters from Maine and bringing them to Tennessee or something. No, you're you know? driving 100 miles to the mill. Okay, so that, that works, because like, the one question I was going to ask you is, it seems like there was this exponential thing where it gets way more and more difficult because the energy density of lithium-ion batteries is, is, is shit. Like, yeah, where it's kind awful. of, like, it, it, it's efficient uh, in terms of, like, what, how much you weigh versus gas, but, like, gas is so, so energy dense, and this, it, it almost doesn't matter because it's so light. So, like, I was wondering how you were dealing with that problem as a truck, and I guess the answer is a giant, a battery that's, like, three or four times the size of what you get in a Tesla, and you're not going really long distances. Because, like, the thing that I find is kind of funny is when they try to pretend that this is kind of semi-viable, like, viable when you have like when they're putting similar to tesla size batteries in a ford f-150 lightning and then like you know you try to haul something and you yeah know, like there was a guy that did that, 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 that this and he's showing like you know he's go every mile he goes he's losing like three or four yeah. miles of range and he wasn't even doing it in the cold and like it just becomes a joke but like you found a way to make this actually very viable but it actually makes sense for what you're doing because a it's not long distance but more importantly you're going up a very very large hill with nothing and you're going down the hill with thousands of pounds of shit so this is literally the the ideal scenario to have an electric motor because you're actually making very good use of all that regenerative braking power going down which is but even in that scenario it's still not enough power just off batteries alone like we put a diesel generator in it so it's like a freight train how it's a hybrid it's a yeah it's a plug-in <laughs> hybrid in, it's a plug -in. <laughs> instead of running a 15 liter diesel 100 percent of the time you're now running a nine liter diesel half the time like in a logging application you can see a 70 80 percent reduction in fuel mileage so in a logging truck will burn a thousand dollars a day in fuel up in canada that's 500 700 bucks a day fuel savings and you're running a small generator at just one RPM. You're not lugging it. So you got all the power, all the torque. You can take advantage of the regen instead of a Jake brake, just make a noise. So it was just, we thought about it and it's the next logical step in the EV. Like everyone wanted to go full EV, full battery. That's it. We're going to go right from full diesel to full EV. 
And EV, when we did the math, that's when we were looking at the Tesla. And we started doing the math and started looking at like what the power requirements were. And you look at a logging truck and you see that the power requirements on a logging truck, notwithstanding regen braking, putting it in there, but you're looking at about two and a half megawatts per day. The Tesla Semi is estimated to be around a thousand kilowatt hours. We need 2,500. So we would need two and a half times the size of a Tesla semi battery just to even make the logging truck do a full day shift which means that i would need to pack sixty thousand pounds of batteries yeah 50 it, it doesn't make it, 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 the more of a load you want to carry the less sense it winds up making yeah and it's just like it, it gets exponentially worse yeah exactly and it, by doing a little hybrid it, we just combined the both the best of both worlds because we ended up losing weight on the truck because the weight reduction on the motor was two thousand pounds the batteries weighed about 1,500 pounds, transmission and everything. So on our first truck, we lost about 200, 300 pounds worth of weight reduction. That's, that's a very impressive. And the fact that you're able to do that while simultaneously making it like somewhat affordable and also efficient. Efficient. And it's, I, I do stand by that we used off-the-shelf parts for that. It, that was the biggest thing. Yeah, and one of the things that I've been like really driving home to my audience, because they keep saying, like, fuck EVs, EVs suck. If you buy an EV, you're a dumbass, you're a pussy, whatever. Is, is like, th the thing that drives me the most nuts is that like, e the electric motor, this is over 100-year-old technology. Yeah. Like, what I tell people is do not blame the tech, blame the manufacturer. Like, smartphone, there's nothing about a smartphone that requires that you not be able to install an operating system of your choice. No. That manufacturer, like Samsung decided to lock the bootloader and not allow you to unlock the bootloader in your phone. You used to be able to do that, now you can't. Uh, you know, the electric ve you know, vehicle manufacturers, the fact that this has an electric motor does not mean that it also has to be locked down, that everything inside it has to be a subscription, that you not be able to access anything inside of it, that you have to have like what Mercedes have with the EQS where you have a warning saying, do not open your hood when you get on the <laughs> yeah. screen. Like this, the, all oh. of this stuff is not unique. Like, I, you know, I love electric motors. I had so much fun, you know, playing with uh, the, all these different types of e-bike motors. And like, I find that a lot of fun. I have, a, I have a controller at home. I think it's based in the ASI, BAC, 800 it's a phase runner i can adjust my own pid loop if i want yep. like, there's all sorts of crazy stuff i could do so there's this idea that if i buy an electric vehicle i have to give up freedom that's simply the way it is and they're just so intertwined and linked and what i love about what you've done is you've proven literally the exact opposite is the case and i like seeing that 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 pushback against it because it, it because normal vehicle manufacturers like all of this stuff is going to come to internal combustion engine vehicles because all the stuff you're talking about with a lot of these trucks that are less repairable nowadays than what they used to be. All, all of that is happening on things that do not have, you know, a battery bigger than the soldering iron. I yeah, guess. and they're, they're using the electrification and the, ooh, scary batteries as a way, like, e there's so many things, like, you cannot open the hood of this Mercedes. No, you cannot work on your electric vehicle at all. It's dangerous. It's got batteries. And that's true. The batteries are dangerous. Y you can get killed by the batteries, but you can get killed by high voltage working in a sawmill. But you know what they do? They have a, electricians at a sawmill where they have all those three-phase electrical motors and it's lockout, tagout procedures. L you lock out the power, so you disconnect the power, you put a lock on it, nobody can re-energize this power, and then you verify that the power is out. You put your voltmeter, you put your safety gloves on, you put your voltmeter on one end, you put your voltmeter on the part you're working on. Yes, I see zero volts, zero amps. It's now safe to work on. You just need to train lockout. Every industrial mechanic, industrial electrician knows lockout, tagout procedures, but all these auto manufacturers are saying that, no, we, there's no way that our mechanics can learn or any other mechanics can learn lockout, tagout. You got to bring it to our shop because only our mechanics can do lockout, tagout. Out, and it's BS. It's just a way that you have to go back to Ford. You have to put their software on it. You have to pay their things. And you're seeing that I've talked to people that have bought electric trucks and you can see exactly where it is. Like on the electric semi side there, it'll be even be in the shop and they say, oh, well, you, you, that's an electric truck. Our normal shop rate's 200, but it's 450 an hour for the electric truck shop rate because we need a specialist to work on this electric truck. So you got to pay over two and a half times the price of the rate. By the way, it's a four or five hour minimum. You're like, well, I just need a brake job done. You're like, no, it's an electric truck. It's still going to be 400 bucks an hour to service the brakes on that electric truck just because it could be dangerous and we don't know where the high voltage is. So nobody else can work on it and they try and lock out as many things as you can. Don't repair anything. It's unsafe. And it's just, it's a BS way of making you pay more. Yeah, and one of the things that we were talking about before we even started the video that I think is worth going over again is like, that every single time we enter a new technological paradigm, there's some way to take away freedom in the name of safety and security. Mm -hmm. Like like with that, like you know, you may get raped in a parking lot if you have an independent be able to fix your car. 
but let's just forget about the fact that all the data being stored in your car is being done by the manufacturer that actually fought in court for the ability to continue doing that. And in Washington, they actually saw that, said that that didn't break any privacy laws, which absolutely blows my effing mind. <laughs> but like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll remind me to link that video down below when I'm done with this, because that's th th there was one case I went over with a th with this uh, Washington uh, judge said that. The car manufacturers take, uh, essentially what they do is they take all the data from your phone, like when you're syncing shit via Bluetooth messages and all that. You can't delete that. And apparently the reason that the plaintiffs were not able to get their complaint forward is because they had not been harmed yet by it. So like, you have to wait until, so you have to wait until they actually show your wife the texts that you were sending your girlfriend and blackmail you. Then you can make a claim. But anyway. That's like somebody pointing a gun in your face and be like, well, this guy's got a gun in my face. I don't like this guy pointing a gun at me. And be like, well, you got to wait until he actually <laughs> shoots you before you complain about it. That's yeah. insane. Yeah, well, like, the, the, to the point, of, with the, what, I was try, what I was trying to get to, and then I went off on a tangent like I always do. I got to stop. Yeah, me too. I, I'm it's, so bad yeah, at that. Like the, is the, there's, we were, like, when we were kids, we were around the same generation. Like in 1993, 1990, even 1994, like, I would tell my parents, like, as, if, as long as I wasn't a complete delinquent, like, you know, I'm going to go out and play with my friends. I'm going to go on my bike. Okay, cool. Come back before sundown. I didn't have a beeper. The only people who had beepers in 1993 were drug dealers and Wall Street people. I, you know, not, not, not like eight or ten year olds. You know, I was able to go outside. We were able to have like play on our own. And my, my, my dad did not really know exactly where I was. He had no way of ascertaining it. He couldn't call me. And it was like, whatever. And now, like, I mean, they, almost everybody that I knew that was a parent, like the idea of doing that is insane. And like, I think that we've gotten, we've gone to this point. It's not even necessarily about repair. It's not about repairing cars. It's not about repairing tractors. It's not about repairing cell phones and computers. We've gotten to this point of just infant infantilizing people in general to the point where we, again, like if you just look at it generationally, uh, like you, you're allowed to fix a Ford F-150's brake pads. This can go 80 miles an hour down the highway. This weighs over 4,000 pounds. You can fix this in your driveway and nobody blinks an eye. But like Lewis replaces a 3.7 volt, one cell lithium ion battery for a cell phone. God forbid the world could end. Like there's always yeah. a risk of danger and we've always accepted that there is a risk of danger. There's always risks and rewards. Like in that video on the, the Hyundai, the $60,000 car battery. You know what? Yeah, there may be one person that winds up having a horrible experience in a vehicle as a result of it being repaired improperly out of hundreds of thousands of millions of vehicles. But if the alternative is every single time you get a little bit of rocks that hit the bottom of the cover of your car, you just throw that away and pay $60,000. There's also a societal cost to that. That's that if it only saves one life bullshit that I you know, moved 1,700 miles to get away from. The, the whole idea that, <laughs> like, there, that we cannot consider any other factor if it saves one life, like, th that's the only thing we're looking at that's just kind of gotten ridiculous. Uh, and I, I hate that because it's, if it saves one life, because there's so many times where you just see it, okay, it might save one life, but then what about somebody else? And it causes negative er externalities elsewhere that can ha hurt somebody. Yeah, like now, you can't protect everybody. And at some point, you just got to be able to say, you're on your own, bud. I mean, if every farmer is going to be waiting, let's say, a week or two for a dealer technician to come out and they have downtime, that, that's going to have a negative impact on the cost of food. There are so many mil there's so many millions of potential externalities that can occur that are not very easy to measure once you decide that something that would otherwise be two to $600 now needs to cost $60,000 in the name of safety and security. And <laughs> like if no, it's very easy to, to like fetishize safety and security to the point of using it as an excuse to, for every single reason to deny somebody the ability to work on what they own. Yeah. And like I, I don't, I don't, I genuinely, I don't even believe it's like it's a laptop thing, a cell phone thing, a tractor thing, a medical device thing. Uh, it, it, it's, I feel like it's a cultural thing of like just, yeah, that's high voltage, that's dangerous. I mean, well, like you know, this vehicle also has you know, gasoline flowing. Through. There's so many things that you can do that could kill you six ways to Sunday servicing an internal combustion engine vehicle. I've been saying like if. It was the opposite, and we had electric vehicles brought out when freedom was big back in the 1920s, and somebody tried to bring out a gas motor now, somebody would come out and there'd be some Karen that says, no, 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 you can't service a fuel tank, you can't fill your own car, you could spill fuel, that's flammable, that can create a fire, we can't allow that, you gotta go to, a, 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 we're gonna come out with a gas car or a diesel car, and you can only fill it up at a Ford dealership, and only our technicians will be allowed to fill your gas car, I would 100% believe that they would do that I if mean, we if came out with gas cars. If now. you just search YouTube, like, for the, just these three words, a cigarette gas station, like, <laughs> you'll see a lot of, like, I mean, 
I, yeah, I, I could completely see where you're coming from. Where like if 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 the if the internal combustion engine vehicle came out after the electric vehicle, what if somebody smokes a cigarette at a gas station? What if this? What if that? There's so many things that could potentially happen, and like it drives me nuts. I, I get it. Like there are issues there are with the, if you service an electric vehicle improperly, people can get hurt. Yeah. But you know if you service an internal combustion engine improperly, people can get hurt. These trucks are twenty thousand pounds. They go eighty miles an hour. They carry all sorts of stuff. They do not stop very quickly. And it has like you know, it has f f uh, liquid inside of it that can go on fire. Like yeah. there's so many things that could go wrong if you're doing a frame repair on this, rust repair, like, any sort of repair after any sort of collision. And we, we we accept that risk as a society because we believe that throwing away something that costs sixty thousand or two hundred thousand dollars to build over something basic is bullshit. And yep. like th th there is a cost to that that we and we used to have the common sense to know not to do that. So it, this brings me to the question on your on w everything that you're putting together. What are you doing differently than everybody else to ensure that your devices are repairable and what are the frustrations that people have with other devices in your industry that they won't have when they buy your stuff? Well, we used off the shelf parts. That was a big one. It's like well you look, it's a small team. We don't have a bunch of engineers. So we looked at our old trucks and I had a lot of old trucks from the 60s and 70s and they're all using, trucks were really standardized back in the day. It didn't matter whether it was a Freightliner, a Mac, a Western Star, they used the same brake pots, the same turn signals. It was actually mandated by the government back then um, because long story short, they were worried after World War II, they bombed all the German factories and they were worried the Soviets were gonna bomb the factories over here. And while they bombed the factories, trucks are so important to national defense, national supply, people starve to death if we don't have trucks. If our factories get bombed in a war, we need to be able to repair by pulling parts off of this truck, pulling parts off of this truck. So they standardized it and it was standard basically up until the 1980s. So you've seen all these trucks have the same parts. They've been mass produced, so they're cheap because the patents have all expired on these parts. People mass produce the parts. They're still used all over the world. You can get the parts anywhere for cheap. So when we looked and designed it, we said, well, why are we gonna make our own, why am I gonna build my own $1,400 headlight assembly? I'll just go buy that $30 headlight assembly that's in all these other trucks and I'll put that on there. I'll buy that brake pot, I'll break, buy those brake pads and we'll put those together. So the result is, is it saved us a lot of money in engineering. It saved us a lot on production costs. It allowed us to get a truck built, built quicker because we didn't have to build custom parts on the truck. We just, we immediately started at the assembly phase. Engineering, we didn't have to build parts. We just went straight to building after engineering. And then the result is, is that now when these trucks are on the road, people can walk into like an industrial supply store. Like we went to go look at that old Laterno from the 60s. What parts do they have? What parts does my local industrial supply, electrical supply store have? We use those parts. So I like to say that Edison is one of the few companies where we could totally go bankrupt. Like as an EV company, Edison Motors could go under. We're a small company, it's a risk. But if somebody buys one of our trucks, they're still gonna be able to get the parts everywhere for the truck. So we've had people call me from other EV companies where they've said, hey, I bought this EV, can you work on it? And like, I bought an EV from this company blank, they've gone out of business, can you work on my bus and fix my bus for me? I said, well, no, they've locked all the parts out. I can't even access it, I can't reprogram it. There is nothing I can do to help you. Like, I, I don't have access. With ours, it's all the same parts. And I can send a parts list where, to show you like the ESOF Pacific trucks back in the day, went out of business in the 1990s. I bought a Pacific gravel truck two years ago. Some of the guys at Pacific still have the parts. And when I bought a truck, the owner of that truck phoned Pacific to let them know I bought it. Then Pacific called me and said, do you need the parts book or anything for this truck? I got the whole parts assembly. So this is a company that hasn't been in business for 30 years and they gave me the entire parts list of everything on the truck so I can keep that truck going. And when I was talking to the owner of the Pacific trucks, he said that 50% of every truck that they made since the 1960s till the 1980s are still on the road today because they did that. Our trucks are gonna be the same way. With the same parts, you can go into the same supply store, pick up those parts, change it. We haven't locked anything out from the software. We've made the software open, it's available. You can change what you want on it. You may void a warranty, we'll say that. Like, yeah, if you, if you wanna massively change your parameters, and we don't recommend them, you'll probably void your warranty, but I'm not gonna stop you from doing that. It's, it's your risk. If you wanna say, well, I wanna just overpower this truck and have insane power all the time, we'll say, you probably shouldn't, but you can. But that means that if we go under, there's a lot of smart people that can look at code. So even if you couldn't even get 
somebody from Edison. You can take it to whatever shop, look at the code, and I'll read that, rewrite that for you. We don't lock it out. How about it? That's awesome. <laughs> okay, so how much of your business right now is like building these from scratch versus retrofitting existing trucks with, with all your equipment and the way that you make them? So we built the f um, first truck was from scratch, frame rails up because we wanted to prove it, but now we're going a lot back into the retrofit. So we're building another five semi trucks next year because I want to go a little bit slower and we're retrofitting a few. So we're doing one retrofit, three new builds, and then on the pickup side, we're going to be doing four or five retrofits because I am not going down that nightmare of new truck builds. I do not have that kind of money right now. <laughs> Semi-trucks are surprisingly easy. Okay, so you're, you're taking existing trucks and like you're adding this technology to them, the diesel generator, electric motors, yeah. and everything else. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So you're essentially, you know, the whole like reuse, recycle, renew, well, repair, like you, you're reusing shit that already exists and just yeah. making it better and more efficient. Like this, this, is, what, this is what EV technology should be doing. Like yeah. you should be able to take your old shit box and make it able to use regenerative braking and well, rather than throw it away when every th all the all the internal combustion engine components die inside of it. Like this 100%, is really cool. Hundred percent. I get so mad because everybody says like, "Well, you need to go EV to save the planet, lower your emissions." But then the EV car lasts for four or five years, and then you throw it out and you buy another EV. How is that better for the planet if it's just a piece of junk you throw out? And they're mandating that we have to buy electric vehicles in Canada by all by 2035. 100% of the vehicles on the sold in Canada have to be electric. But if they only last four or five years, and instead of getting 10, 20 years out of it, well, how is that better for the environment when you could retrofit it? If you got a truck with good bones, good frame rails, good body, but you put, you're a trucker, you're working it, you've been putting on the miles, your engines wore out, transmission rear ends are wore out, why not just take it in, switch it? I'll put a diesel generator, I'll put some batteries in the frame rail, I'll switch the rear ends and you got another good truck good to last you another 10, 20 years. Yeah, it's much, and it's a lot more efficient that way. Yeah, and like even with batteries, that's the one question we got. Yeah, batteries technology is getting better. It's not there yet. So what, what, are you do, what are you using for batteries right now? Like I imagine you're not, are you, are you sitting there like making your own bus rails and everything no. or is this like some other solution? So there's enough companies that just sell batteries. Okay. And you can buy a full battery modules for like 8,000 bucks. And we just put them in the frame rails so they're protected. They're in the frame rails. We didn't lock them in custom things. You got to take the whole cab and do everything else to get it expensive. If you have a battery issue, so say 10 years down the line, you got a battery that's worn out, you need a new battery. Well, maybe you need two, eight to $16,000. You're looking at an engine rebuild in 10 years, pop them out, put them back in. It's a three hour job. You're back on your way. It's not $60,000 because I got to rip the whole cab off with custom battery. Like that's, that's how they get you. Are, are you using it out of I, I really should have done some more research before asking you, even asking you this question, but you're using like lithium polymer or lithium ion? Lithium iron. Okay. So like, what are you doing for like heating and cooling? So they got heat pads in them naturally. So that heats them. But because in Canada, we're cheating a little bit because it's a hybrid with diesel. So if you need additional cooling, we can use a diesel-fired heater, heat the coolant lines, and we can flow warm f fluid right through it. All right, cool. Because yeah, like, it's, it's not even so much the output. It's like if you try to charge lithium-ion batteries below a certain... You can you use can. a lithium-ion battery below a certain temperature. Oh, yeah. You can output. Output is fine. When you try to charge them below a certain temperature that you start getting into like serious shit. And yeah, you, normally the BMS, so. if it's below zero degrees Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit, will just stop the charge. It won't let you, if the BMS is working and doing its job, it'll say the battery cell temperature is below zero degrees, so I'm not going to let you charge it. And then the battery heat pads warm up, and there's a couple cool things you can do. Like... We do have some CAN bus stuff in there. It's not all analog. You have to go with CAN bus to monitor. And there's cool things, but it, the heat pads will turn on. They'll start warming the batteries. If it's real cold, minus 30 below, that warm glycol can start flowing through there constantly. And then it allows the charge. Uh, one thing I'm curious about when it comes to how you're locking these or not locking them is I, I remember speaking to an engineer for a major car company. I'm not going to say who because you know, he's for me to secrecy <laughs> here. But when I was talking about like, you know, being able to modify my PID loop on, my, on this e-bike motor, and there was one point when I was messing with integral gain. And usually I have like my proportional gain set to like 2.5, 2.7, and my integral gain set to 10. And you know, the default is I think like 0.7 uh, proportional gain and like integral gain was like 300. And I had a typo. Instead of typing in 300, I typed in 3000. Um, you can imagine uh, how, how this went. So I, <laughs> I, I touched the throttle just to test it without anything else happening that before I even noticed that the chain was essentially, it, it, it hit so hard that it, like before the wheel even moved, the chains broke, it flew 
It cut a chunk of skin off the side of my <laughs> knee. It left a hole in the drywall of the room that I'm in. And one of the things that he was saying is, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have to tell you this, but you could have, if, you, if you make that mistake with the vehicle that he's responsible for engineering, which is a major vehicle for a major brand, if, you, if you're able to set your own PID loop, it would be, if you enter a typo, what could happen is the wheels will come off. Of, instead of you move the car moving forward, the wheels will shoot off of the car and will go through the wall of the building in front of you. Um, and like, so I'm it's bad. Yeah, yeah. So like, it, it, it is a d now as much as I am all for user freedom in every way. Like, there are. It's if you're tuning like your 1972 Ford Mustang. I don't know, your tour bus, whatever. The, all the shit that you can do to that, you're not. You can make it go faster. And you could probably screw things up by making it go faster. But you're not at the point where like the wheel is literally. You don't have the potential to shoot the wheel off of the car so fast that it's actually going to go through the building in front of you. So like how much, if at all, is any of your stuff locked down so that if somebody is, is logging in there and being a dipshit like me that they don't wind up doing that? Or is that just... So uh, the one way, so we have the basically the driver information displays that come up, the tablet where you can access everything. And like we show all fault codes, everything on there. But the way we can do it is you can enter like the owners or mechanics things and you can adjust the speed, you can adjust the charging, like how, what's my acceleration time that I'm gonna allow the driver, what's the top speed. So there's an onboard thing where we already know what the safe parameters are and we let it play it with. But how we're not locking it down is on the other side is that it's not like the code is locked down where you can't access it, you can't like, you don't have to really hack into it. If somebody knows how to plug into a computer, find, get the code, rewrite the code, they can. Number one, because I think you should be able to if you're allowed it. Now, I am not going to warranty your truck. And you are on your own if you change that and you go into it. But it's open source. You can get it. You can find out what it is. You can play with all the parameters. You can start changing things. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can blow it up. And as far as I'm concerned, it's your property. You own it. If you want to destroy it, you probably can. You, I have given you the physical ability to do it. I haven't locked it down, which means that if you want to change things and if you have an error where you know what, I don't like that inverter. I found this inverter in the shop. I want to program it and I need to make this inverter work. And you got a guy that's good on computers. Perfect. He can program that one if he knows what he's doing. The average person, normally when somebody can do that stuff, they know what they're doing. They can double check their things. It's not accessible to the average person that doesn't know, but it is accessible for a guy that does know. That's kind of how we do that balancing act is that if you're smart enough to get into it, I'm not going to lock you out of it. But I'm hoping if you're smart enough to get into it, you're smart enough to know what you're doing. And if not, that's on you. I'm smiling because I'm the exception to this rule that I know. <laughs> no, I, I, you should have seen our guys. I, I am definitely not the smart one here because there's been so many times where I'm like, can we do this? And they're like, no, but that's more power. Yeah, yeah, I know how to get into the menu, but I'm a complete idiot as soon as I get into it. And I'd be the person that was like sending their wheels through a building. So my follow-up question to that is how many of these trucks have had their wheels fly through buildings, go on fire, you know, get destroyed horribly because you have this pro freedom mindset that every other automaker says they can't have because of safety and security. I mean, we've what had are your stats? we've had zero. No, nobody's done that. Like we played around with different things, and I've definitely left rubber on things and all that. And people have people have played, people have had fun. But normally, when you're dealing with something like an RC car or something a little smaller motor, and people play around, when people are dealing with a three hundred thousand dollar truck they tend to be a little bit more like i guess we're not at the point where these have been available to the general public long enough or anything like that where people have been able to hack in but yeah somebody could do something like that but it's like way i look at it is you got to think about it in a safety aspect it's like you could be dangerous you could do something dangerous you could other hurt other people you could hurt yourself you could go out, you could buy a shotgun and you could massively damage somebody some by overpowdering it or firing it off in a dangerous spot, but you don't say let's ban all the shotguns because somebody might do something dumb with one at some point. You say that, hey, no, we're going to teach somebody how to use it responsibly and if they don't, that's on them. I look at it the same way as that. It's... Yeah, you, you're definitely in the right state to say that part out loud. Uh, but the, the thing that gets me the most is like the, the idea that Nobody should be able to have the freedom to be able to do this because you're all too stupid and you're all going to do stupid things with freedom. And what I like about the, your company is that you've essentially given people all of that ability and all of that freedom and they've kind of like re repaid you and for, for it by not doing something stu horribly stupid with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that's continue. But if they do, people do stupid things. People do stupid things. I can't control it, what people do. And it's, 
I believe that somebody does have that personal freedom. Like, you own the truck. As far as I'm concerned, at the end of the day, how I view it, they buy the truck, they own the truck, they should have a right to do with what they want with the thing they own. Okay, so now, what, what, what are your plans for the future? I usually hate this question because I very rarely have a plan for anything. I just kind of like YOLO <laughs> and try to make things work as I go. Um, I, have, I have like a couple of ideas and I try to like have rails so that I don't go completely off. Like, what, what are your plans for the future with this? You just... Oh, we're, uh, yeah, we're building these trucks for a few. So we're testing out a few different industries, building more trucks, and we're just going to keep growing. The biggest one, we just launched a pickup truck kit. A lot of people were saying the same things. Like, we were saying this with the semi-trucks. And, uh, like, this is what I want. This is why it makes sense. And people are like, well, I got pickup trucks, and I want to be, I want to do electric. I'm interested in electric. I'm interested in the hybrid. But I sure don't want a Ford Lightning that I can't work on or doesn't have the range. Can you do something for the pickup? And we started looking at it, and, like, well, we can use the same batteries, but instead of using six batteries, I can use two batteries. Instead of having five inverters, I can have two inverters. We can use the same parts. The axle might be a little bit smaller. The electric motor might be a little bit smaller, but the fundamental, all the things like the fuses, the relays, all of that can be the same parts. So we could just make the same kit for pickups. So we just launched that one. Awesome. Uh, but um, we just ordered the parts for the first pickup and we're gonna start building it here. Hopefully they should be showing up in May. So what are you retrofitting? You said like that, that, that I imagine you're retrofitting existing uh, internal combustion engine pickup trucks to yeah. make them electric. Like, well, what are the, some of your first few projects? Uh, so one guy uh, we're working with, uh, DeBoss Garage there, he bought a 2006 Chevy 3500 Dually. One of our other installers that are going to be ins helping us install these kits, he went out when he heard what we were doing and immediately went to the auction and bought a service truck with a blowing motor. So all the tool cabinets, like he bought an F550 service truck. Wow. And then the one we're doing, we're still debating, like I, somebody's thinking like an old, old uh, body style Ford. I kind of want to do, do up like a 1952 Dodge Power Wagon. The jury's still out. We're still debating. Like, I, I think something cool from the 50s with, like, 500 horsepower. Like, it's got 500 horsepower, 8,000 foot-pounds of torque, and I think that'd be sweet in a 1950s truck. That's awesome. Uh, so what, what does that cost, like, the kit by itself? Or, like, do you, do you actually do you sell the kit, or do you just, like, sell kit with installation service? Like, how does that work? Uh, so we just started partnering up with some installers now. So we're training up these installers, and that's what we're going to be doing over the next year, year and a half, is training up these guys on how to work with it because I didn't like the way that small shops were getting pushed out of the industry by all these big shops. You can see that what they're doing with EV is that you small shops can't work on it. And I said, that's stupid. So basically reached out and we got a bunch of smaller shops you know they might have four bays five bays if you want to like start learning on evs we'll teach you up on the edison kit and then because it's not practical to ship all the trucks in north america to merit british columbia canada and then back so i'm like i'll train local guys on how to service evs so if ford and tesla aren't going to start training people on how to service evs i'll do it myself and then they can sell the kits so we'll they can have the kit from us where or the customer can then buy the kit from us and then have it installed through a trained installer and then they can do it or they can have it themselves if they want the option of like hey i want to install this thing myself cool you can buy the kit yourself and do it yourself we're not going to warranty that but uh, it's it's like a the way i view it is you know when you can rebuild an old engine so you can if you got an old diesel engine you can go into cummins and you can buy a rebuild kit like a reman kit and you can tear your own engine down and you can put in new liners new pistons new rings new top end totally redo it yourself and some people can and some people screw it up and blow their engine up but cummins will say i'll sell you the kit but if you blow it up that's on you if you go to a trained cummins rebuilder somebody that's certified we'll give you a three-year warranty with the thing it's a little bit more expensive because you're paying for the guy's skills so if we train somebody, we'll warranty it. If somebody takes it on their own, they can do it themselves. But they should have the right, if they want to, to do it. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm excited for you. I hope, I hope your way wins. I do, too. I think it's... I think like every single time you see a story like that like the bullshit Hyundai $60,000 battery thing, <sighs> the thing that killed me about that one the most, it's not just that they did it. 
It's that they tried to take it back after the fact. So I don't know how, how much of that story did you follow? I followed a fair okay. bit of it. So like, okay, the fir- where do we even begin? That was an independent dealer that misquoted you. So like, at first, it's only authorized people can do work. Only, uh, only the mm-hmm. chosen ones. Only the, like the members of our congregation may touch these cars. <laughs> and then the moment they fuck something up, it's oh yeah, that was an independent. Like no, bitch, it's one or the other. Like you get to choose. It's this or that. Yeah. Which one is it? Like, it, they're either the only, it's either you're going to get raped in a parking lot if somebody else works on your car, or these are independent. Th- th- that's the first one. After that, you have to deal with the fact that, like, they, were act- they said, well, that was a misquote, but then they had four separate dealers that gave the exact same quote. And then the third part of it was after all of this came out, they said, okay, cool, we'll give you a discount on the vehicle, uh, on a new vehicle. <sighs> but after all of that came out, in, 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 was gone over in great detail, they still held on to the we cannot replace this metal cover because of safety. I'm kind of curious, how would you deal with something like that? Like, how would the battery, you know, I, I mean, I, I know these are logging trucks. It's not a, you know, a piece of shit consumer sedan. So, like, but how, how are you storing the batteries so that if you go over, uh, like, some road debris or a shitty construction site, like where they're doing construction in my house right now, how are you dealing with that so that that doesn't destroy, you know, break into the battery as a safety issue? I mean, eventually, at one point, you can do it. But we put the uh, batteries on airbags. Like, the truck air suspension rides on airbags. The cab rides on airbags. So we put the batteries on airbags, so they're independent of the frame rail, so your batteries can bounce freely. So if they hit a bump, it can bounce it up, and we put a big skid plate under it. Like, I ran with, like, a real thick, thick skid plate on the back of that. So you can bounce those batteries. They'll move up. But eventually, no matter what you do, you could probably destroy something. You give something to a logger and say you can't destroy it, he will (laughs) prove you wrong 30 (laughs) minutes later. (laughs) But the best thing you can do is protect it, but then have a plan for when it fails. What happens when this fails? What happens when our protection doesn't work? Okay, perfect. Well, it's on four airbags. It's held on with eight bolts. I can undo those eight bolts. I can lift it off with the sling. Like it already has in the cradle that holds the batteries, pre-existing points to attach a sling. So that your crane, you roll it into the shop. You can either drop it through the bottom, like a transmission, slide it out, or you can pick it up from above, slide it out. But doing a battery re and re is about an hour, an hour long job. Battery. Eight bolts out, battery down with a transmission hoist, pull it out, like disconnect it, roll them out, new ones in, lift it up, re-put your bolts back in, reconnect your electrical lines, reconnect your coolant lines, you're good to go. Like that's an hour, two hour job. That's not a $80,000, $60,000 battery swap. Like, I mean, it's, it's either one or two things are, tr- are true. Either A, they're full of shit, or B, they're telling the truth and they actually put together a vehicle that is so fucking flimsy that if it goes over a couple of rocks in the road and it gets a little bit of road debris hit, hitting the bottom cover, that you now have a bomb. Like, it's one or the other. And I don't, and like, they, they're both horrible. <laughs> they're both bad. Like, it's not like one makes them look better and one is like, the, no, trust me, you'll understand after this explanation. Like, either way, it's... Like, it, the, the sad thing is this. is like, I kind of thought, okay, maybe Hyundai actually came out as kind of anti-subscription and anti-all that bullshit earlier in 2023. So I kind of thought... Uh, you know, if I was going to get into something new, maybe that. And then I just see that tap, and it's like, I will never purchase a Hyundai, ever. Oh, I hate the subscription. I have made it very clear, very publicly, that there is not going to be any subscriptions on the Edison truck. You're going to buy the truck, and then that's it. What if they want a subscription? I don't know. They can subscribe to Sirius <laughs> XM then. <laughs> like, no, you don't need a subscription. Like, I hate it. Oh, it's, it's one of my biggest things I've been complaining about. So the trucking industry has mandated e-logs. So you legally have to have an electronic log book as part of your truck in order to legally drive the truck on the road. But the OEM doesn't put a log book in the truck. You have to buy a subscription to add the log. If I can't legally drive it on the road without that subscription or out that log book, why does it have to be a subscription? It should be part of the vehicle. Is this a Canadian thing or a general you, thing? No, it's a U.S. and Canada oh, thing. Fuck. It came out US here first. Canadian yeah, thing. you have to pay a oh, subscription. Yeah. Every single semi-truck you see on the road now has to legally have a subscription. You bought the truck. It's part of the OEM software. Why do I have to go to a third party to have that why can subscription? I, why can't I self-host or self-manage my own lock? Nope, that's totally illegal because then you could alter it. But at the very least... The OEM should be putting out the logbook. Like, why doesn't Kenworth have the logbook with the truck? You just bought a $400,000 truck, and you're telling me you still got to pay $30 a month for the subscription in order to drive the truck? That's disgusting. So what, what, how does yours work? Do you, I mean, if they buy your, uh, one of these retrofitted trucks? We're just putting the logbook in with the system. So yes. we're just putting it in there. It's, it's $60,000 a year for the verification program, but I'm like, well, I'll just eat that cost. And then if somebody wants a different one and they, they're not happy with ours... Wait, that, 
sixty thousand bucks a year. Yeah. You have to, we have to be verified. It has to, you have to be a third party, not the person that owns the truck and you have to pay so much per year. So the government looks at it and says, okay, this does the job. The driver can't alter it. We can't change it. Oh, okay. Hey, you guys have a fun evening to get to. I don't want to take up oh, too much yeah, more time. Thank oh, you so much for taking Hey, no, no. Thanks, so much man. I, this was great. I've yeah. been a huge supporter Thank of you. your work. I, I love yeah. what you do. I really like, again, people always ask, when are you going to give an example of something good? And it's like, where? <laughs> Where? Well, like, said, y- y- you've actually been a huge inspiration on starting this. Like when you started talking wow. about right to repair and everything that's like that, before I ever started at Edison Motors, no I way. loved what you did. I loved you, what you're doing. And no I'm like, fucking way. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, 100%. And I'm like, if I ever start my own company, that's the way I do it. I do it against that. I was agreeing <laughs> with you. And I'm like, you know what? I'm tired of EVs. I'm tired of the, <laughs> like, yeah, Lewis Rossman's right. I'm just going to do it on my, this is the way we're going to do it. And we're going to do it without all of this shit. That's awesome. And then, we figured like the odds of us being successful when we were starting out weren't high. A bunch of loggers working in a tent in Canada. I'm like very, turns out it's actually taken off. But I figured worst case scenario, we'll shake up the industry. We'll show that you can make a truck with some right to repair. We sh- we'll show it how to make it simple. That's why if you watch like our YouTube videos, we show how every nut and bolt goes into that truck. We don't hide anything so that people can see that you can work on it and that everything that these big OEMs is saying is complete BS. But yeah, you're a huge inspiration for thank all that. So so it's it's an honor to meet you here. I didn't fail after all. Well, I appreciate it. Thank <laughs> no, you thank you, thank time. you. All right, that's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. <laughs> and out.